and hello from the campus of Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We welcome you to Virtual SEI. Our presentation today is Digital Footprints, what can be learned from the traces we leave on social networks. My name is Shane McGraw, be your audience moderator for today's presentation, and I'd like to thank you for attending. We want to make today's event as interactive as possible, so we will address questions throughout today's presentation and again at the close of the presentation. And you can ask those questions at any time, depending on what platform you're watching on, through the Q&A or chat tabs. Um, well, what else here? Also, we will have a survey. That survey tab will be in our chat window here in a second, as your feedback is always greatly appreciated. So please complete that upon exiting today's event. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce our two speakers for today. April Galliard is a statistician and data scientist specializing in applications of statistical machine learning tools to cognitive science, learning analytics, and educational data mining. Welcome, April. Next, we have Carson Sestilli, and Carson is a machine learning research scientist within our CERT division in their data science group, where he uses data science, statistics, and machine learning for research in cybersecurity and intelligence. Carson, welcome. Thank you for having me. And now we're going to turn it over to April. April, all yours. <laughs> Thank you. So it, it seems pretty obvious that one of the reasons we're talking about this right now is everything that's just come out recently about the Cambridge Analytica and, and Facebook Association. And so uh, maybe we should start with what happened Yeah, with can you that. remind me? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Cambridge Analytica set up a survey to uh, it looked like a scientific survey, and they actually used a scientific personality survey. And a lot of Facebook users went there taking the personality survey and answered a lot of other questions. And then they asked through the Facebook API to have access to the user's account through that API. And a lot of users said yes. But when they went, when they shared their data, then they also got, they shared a lot of their friends' data as well. Friends who had not used the survey. Friends who had not taken the survey, friends who gave no permission mm -hmm. to let their data go out. And so I don't have the numbers quite right off the top of my head, but it was something like 30,000 people filled out the survey and they shared like more than 100,000 people's data through that. So just all those first network connections, so much data got out. Mm -hmm. And then that data was used uh, for a lot of political purposes in the last election. And so that's the, the fact that that happened and data was used in ways that surprised people, I think, is, has restarted a national conversation about how data gets used. Mm -hmm. and, and so we wanted to contribute to that national conversation. And I think even also what data even is. Uh, that's part of- Metadata. Right. What, kinds of things, yeah. That, that's part of what we're about to talk today, about today as well is, um, well, we're about to show a video clip in which a senator during the, the Zuckerberg hearing tries to ask a question about what kind of data is being released, but and, doesn't and quite how, have the language Right, to, and how Facebook uses the data. Mm -hmm. and, and he's trying to ask a really important question. That's one of the reasons I chose this particular clip is because Senator Schatz, the question he's trying to ask is really important, but he doesn't quite get that across. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's play that now. Exactly, because both as a matter of practice and as a matter of not being able to decipher those terms of service and the privacy policy is what exactly are you doing with the data and do you draw a distinction between uh, data collected in the process of utilizing the platform and that which we clearly volunteer to the public to present ourselves to other Facebook users? Senator, I'm not sure I, I fully understand this. In general, you're, you're, you, people come to Facebook to share content with other people. We use that in order to also uh, inform how we rank services like newsfeed and ads to provide more relevant experiences. Let, let, me, tr let me try a couple of specific examples. If I'm, email, if I'm emailing, emailing within WhatsApp, does that ever inform your advertisers? No, we don't see any of the content in WhatsApp. It's fully encrypted. Right, but the, is there some algorithm that spits out some information to your ad platform? And then, let's say I'm emailing about Black Panther uh, within WhatsApp. Do I get a WhatsApp? Do I get a Black Panther uh, banner ad? Senator, we don't 
Facebook systems do not see the content of messages being transferred over WhatsApp. Yeah, I know, but that's, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking about whether these systems talk to each other without a human being touching it. Senator, I think the answer to your specific question is if you message someone about Black Panther and WhatsApp, it would not inform uh, any ads. Okay. Okay, so what, what Senator Schatz is really trying to ask is, you know, is there a distinction between the data we choose to share and what we know we're sharing and the data which is just vacuumed up? Mm -hmm. And how do you use the data that's vacuumed up? And the answer that Zuckerberg didn't give is, yeah, we use all of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's so much that I, there's so much information I know just about who you're talking to and not even about the, like, I don't have to know for sure the content the content right, of the your content. conversation, but something about who I'm talking to can also tell me a lot about what we could be talking about. Right, and and so you know the we don't use that information for ads is that's a shortcut around the the question that Senator Schatz was trying to ask. Mm -hmm. So let's see if this works. Um, so. I thought this XKCD cartoon, um, this is, this is a quite, quite, cartoon's actually like three or four years old, which is why it's extra funny to me now, because it's when a user takes a photo, the app should check whether they're in a national park, oh sure, that's easy, and check whether the photo is of a bird. I'll need a research team in five years. Well, since this is three or four years old, yeah, we can almost do it's that It's doing now. a pretty good job, yeah. yeah we're, 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 much, we're much better at, we can tell whether there's probably a bird in that photo. Right. But the point is that it, it can be really hard to explain the difference between what's easy and what's almost impossible. And of course, what's imp almost impossible is changing every day. Mm -hmm. So today, we're going to try and explain at least some of the things that are super easy to do with the kinds of data that Facebook has. The, the stuff that a lot of the CS researchers and statisticians know, oh yeah, yeah, we learned that uh, in undergrad yeah. kind of things that a lot of people don't know are even possible. It's worth knowing if you're in the audience and you're thinking, well, I don't use Facebook, I'm fine, right? Uh, uh, everything that we're saying today about Facebook can be used for many forms of communication. And in fact, even not, uh, later in the talk it'll be, even when you're not communicating with somebody, there's information that you give away about yourself um, when, you, when you do online activity. Right. Facebook's the reason we're talking about it, right. but this is they're not the only everybody, ev yeah. every everybody who's online. This is an issue. Right. Um, so let's start with what is metadata. So I tend to think of metadata as it's the outside of the envelope. Like you don't get to see what's in the package. Uh, the content is what you get to see if you open the package. The metadata is what's on the envelope. But if you think about that, you've got a recipient, you've got a sender, you've got a date. You know what kind of package it is. You know how big the package is. Was it insured? This one has eBay on the label. So there's a, actually a lot of data that's outside of the envelope data. Mm -hmm. um, so when Zuckerberg says we don't see any content, that's kind of misleading because there's a lot of information that's not content. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really to drive this point home, if you are, you see this in a mailbox, and the postman is delivering this mail, so you know, actually paper mail analogy here, this gives you a pretty clear picture of who this person might be. We've got ACLU, NPR, Cook's Illustrated, a bank statement. Without you, opening any Without of opening of anything, yeah. you have a picture. And then this set of mail, you get a very different picture. Again, we haven't opened anything. This is just outside of the envelope. Mm -hmm. And now we can think about this person. Got a parenting magazine, I don't know, some sort of kid's box package thing. Children's hospital bill. That's a lot of children's <laughs> hospital bills. Yikes. And then we see that. Mm -hmm. And again, we haven't opened any envelopes, but we know some of what's going on in this person's life, mm -hmm. and we know it's not good. So that's the first thing. Metadata is data. The data on the outside of the envelope is data, and it can be used. And, sure. and so the, the we don't see any content statement, I find quite misleading. And to go back to, for instance, Zuckerberg's analogy, uh, they don't need to read the content of your text to know that you're the kind of person who might be interested in seeing the movie Black Panther. Um, there's, in fact, you know, there, there are 
not that there's only one kind of person, but there's going to be people who are more interested in that movie than they would be interested in some other movies. And they can absolutely use that content to market to you, to profile you in certain ways, um, only using that information on the outside of the envelope. So uh, just to kind of drive this home, if we've got just three pieces of information, so you have a sender, a recipient, and maybe a date that connection was made. This is just for like email? Yes. Okay. Well, this is, this is um, a area of statistics, social network analysis. Mm. It's um, been done in the social sciences for a long time, but we've, over the last 20 years, figured out ways to make it really quantitative and really precise. Mm. Um, and so if you start with just three pieces of information, that's enough to start using some of these statistical methods. And uh, this example is, I'm probably going to mispronounce her name, but Kieran Healy. Um, she's a social scientist who used some of this on data from Boston in 1772. So a connection between two of these men indicates that they belonged to the same club. So yes, that John Adams, and yes, that Samuel <laughs> Adams, they belong to a club together. And if you do this for all of the clubs in Boston in 1772, you get something like this. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of groups that, okay, these guys all belong to the same two clubs. These guys all belong to the same three clubs. What does the distance in this visualization um, mean? So the, dis this is done, the distance is done algorithmically. Mm -hmm. So the, the closer two points are, um, the, the more they're in the same cluster. It's, okay. it's kind of a spring-loaded The thing. more they're likely to be in the same club, for instance? Um, well, the, the more connections they have together, the closer they're going to be okay. to each other. Sure. Um, and so if you look at this guy right here in the middle, just from looking at the picture, uh, you can see he's in the middle of everything, and he is connected to everybody. Mm -hmm. So... That's Paul Revere. Okay. <laughs> he, is, he is your connection between all of the, the men, the a politically active men in Boston in 1772. Mm -hmm. So the mathematics to make the graph and you know, calculate those distances, that's a little fancy. But to find the guy in the middle, that's like I can count. Sure. And reminder, an, a, a gray line here, an edge is just they were in the same they club. They were in the same club. Okay. There was not even any knowledge about what they would have talked about or nope. when even. This is just, they're in this, the same This club. is just, they knew each other. Okay, yep. They, they saw each other regularly. Got it. Um, and, you know, so if you calculate some of those basic measures of betweenness and centrality, Paul Revere is at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so with three pieces of information per person and... Basically, the only calculation is addition. Mm -hmm. um, we've identified a central figure in the uprising of 1776. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can, there's a tool that was put together a few years ago by a group at MIT where you can explore your own metadata. Mm -hmm. And they uh, will look at your Gmail account and they really just use for this the from, the to, uh, who was CC'd, and, and a timestamp. Uh, and so I went and used this, and to use this app, you have to give them ridiculous permissions to so much of your Google account. So I used it for 20 minutes, and then I deleted all the permissions and deleted all the data. And if you use this, I recommend highly that you do the same, that when you are done, delete everything and remove the permissions. And yeah, as a, and to, this is a little hint at what I'm about to talk about later, but they're very upfront with you. They right. say, if you give us access to your Gmail account, we can see everything. Uh, we promise not to use anything more than the from, the to, the CC, and the timestamp. And we also promise not to sell your data to everybody, but we could if we wanted to. And I think it's very important to understand whenever you're giving an app access like this, they will not always be as upfront right. with you. Well, these guys are researchers, and they're bound by their university's IRB and an mm -hmm. approval process. And there, there are strong controls so that they are upfront and not abusing that mm -hmm. trust. Right. Um, and a lot of advertisers are not bound by the controls right. like that. So this is what I did. And so this is my network from Gmail, people I emailed in 2010. and. The big one, that's my spouse. Uh, in 2010, I was in graduate school, so there's advisor number one. Size of circles is number of size, emails? Num yeah, number, okay. number of emails. And an edge between people indicate that they were CC'd. So you can mm. see a lot of lines between Brian and Steve. So 
that, uh, yes, of course, mm -hmm. I wrote a lot of emails to Brian and Steve because mm -hmm. I was working with both of them. And then the kind of medium-sized one there, Taraj, he was a partner that I worked on a project with. And my connection with all of these people is already public. I have published papers with Taraj and Elizabeth and Derek, so I feel comfortable sharing this because it is known that we work together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and this big cluster here is my family. And again, you, courthouse records, you can find out these are all my family. Uh, and so shift later to 2010, there's Jason, uh, advisor one, advisor two. And now Turage is a little bitty dot. Clearly that project ended. <laughs> and there's the family again. Now the program head's shown up. And the family cluster has moved away a little bit. Now, early 2012, there's a new cluster forming. And if you move to later 2012, there's a big change that's obvious. There's this big new cluster that is not connected to anything that's been going on mm -hmm. before. and and. I showed you so many of the early slides so you could see that it was a pretty stable network. But this is a big change. And so if you're looking at, um, if you're the NSA or you're looking at terrorism suspects or criminal suspects, mm -hmm. this would be an indication that something changed and something is about to go down. Sure, you maybe joined a group. I maybe joined a group. People. Yeah, so like here you can see the clusters maybe starting to form. Mm -hmm. That's maybe suspicions. And now, whoa, mm -hmm. there's something different. And so that indicates that you know, maybe a person's been radicalized or something. In my case, I got a new job. I graduated, <laughs> I was done with my PhD. Sure, that's a likely story. And I got a job, yeah. yes, <laughs> clearly. Uh, yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> and then the fact that people in that group are not connected to anyone else in your network is also relevant, right? Right, that could, be, that could be somewhat alarming because mm -hmm. you know, if I've got a brand new group of friends that aren't connected with any of my old friends, mm -hmm. that's, that could be a big red flag. Know. That's, yeah. yeah, at a bare minimum, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, so that's like if you see just some basic connections. Mm -hmm. You know, I know you, you know me. Uh, you can still see a lot of information there. Mm -hmm. um, but what if we see only your likes? So this is a paper from 2012, and I th this is a legitimate research paper, and I want to emphasize that the people who did this followed the rules. Because um, okay. they actually set up a survey and, a, uh, and had people fill out the, cer the personality quizzes and, and a lot of things, because they wanted to see how predictive likes were and, and just kind of what information was there. And, they did not share the data. They followed the research rules. Um, but this study was kind of the inspiration for what went on with Cambridge Analytica mm -hmm. because they did almost exactly what these guys did. Mm -hmm. um, so here, the, the mathematics in this paper, again, are pretty simple. It's linear algebra. Uh, they took users and what they liked and then they linear algebra to find principal components, eigenvalues, and then they just put it in regression. Can we predict gender? Can we predict uh, race? Mm -hmm. For people in the audience, I guess, for whom that's not obvious, like this is a, you can teach an undergraduate to do this in one week kind of level of, of difficulty. Right, this, this is, is not hard math. No, and, not, not at all. Right. Uh, <laughs> We make sure everybody who is who's interviewing for our group would be able to do this in their sleep, for instance. Right. <laughs> and uh, I also want to point out that the user-like relationship here is is similar in an interesting way to the I've communicated with you relationship because it's just now the edge is we're in the same group again. Exactly. Um, exactly. And now we're this this analysis, and it's important to this just is like me and what I like. Mm -hmm. And so the edge is between me and what I like. Sure. And the fact that I know you is not used in this data at all. What sure. my friends like, anything like that, this analysis ignored that. So this is super simple mathematics using 
very much a reduced form of the available data. Sure. So even if I don't know, even if like I'm in this group about dogs and I don't know the other person in this group about dogs, we may still be similar enough because of our shared interest. Right. And that's what's going on here. Yeah. So we had an attendee question real quick, just oh, back yes. from the, the poll revere slide. Okay. He's asking from Joseph asking, what is why is the central figure in your network the one you care about? <laughs> oh sure. Yeah. So. Oh gosh, that's a lot of slides to go. Um, I'm gonna not go all the way back. <laughs> um, yeah, so this, the central figure in the network, that gets used in a couple of different ways. So uh, one of the earliest things that advertisers did with network analysis and kind of looking at this was looking at, um, well, the central figure in the network, they're the one that's connected to everybody. So if I can give them my product and then they tell all their friends, I will sell more product. Mm -hmm. And you, you see a lot of that kind of thing still with like, you know, the highly rated people on YouTube. Um, you know, the, if you've got a makeup show, they're, they're giving you all kinds of lip gloss and things mm -hmm. because you're going to sell more of it. But also, you know, from a national security perspective, if you're looking at um, the central figure, that's the one that everybody has to communicate with. So if he's not the leader, then he's the one in charge of communications between groups. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's still a high value target for whichever set of purposes you have. Sure, that person knows a lot, no matter what their actual role is within the organization. Right, and you know, and if we think about Paul Revere's role in the revolution, he wasn't the guy that everybody looked like to. He, he didn't wind up president, but he was the one that connected everybody. Right. He's the one that got everybody going. Yeah. I think also to, uh, to bring in a concept that I've heard from design is like there's no average person. Um, people are too very much diverse in order for you to say uh, to design toward the average person. But there are groups of people who have a representation. And so if you know this person is central in some network, a lot of people who are like, a lot of people who are similar to that person, you can, I guess, make some assumptions about them based on the fact that you know that they're pretty similar. And that degree of centrality or of, of being in the middle um, is a good proxy for a lot of people are like this person. And what works on that person is likely to work for other people who are similar right. to them. Right, it, it can help you find somebody who's representative. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. Yeah, good, thank you for that question. Um, and please, if you have any other questions, like please keep them yeah. coming to yeah. us. Give them to us. As <laughs> we have one more in the queue, and, and this may be jumping the gun, so feel oh. free to push off to the end. But Ezra, okay. Ezra wants to know, what would be the ultimate solution for data leakage prevention? So oh. that's we can push off to wow. the end. Yeah. Or if, it's, we, if it's relevant, feel yeah, free so, to. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll go ahead yeah. and give a plug now that um, we're going to talk a lot about that in, in a, a next webinar. This, okay. is, this is the first of a two-part series. So that's the next one is going to talk a lot more about that, but we'll, we'll try and... Even at the end of this webinar, I actually have some material on good practices. Uh, spoiler uh, alert, <laughs> there's no, there's no like, magic hammer, but there are some things you can do to make your life better, at least. And just another one just came in from, from Ellie asking, in regards to important people in the online social networks, are they always the same people, the important people in real life networks? No. No. <laughs> Okay. No. Online life is real life. I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I reject the premise. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kidding, well, it, there's Im important in what way? There's mm. uh, because the people who are central in a network, they're, the idea is that they're often the influencers, maybe the people that you listen to, um, or the people that can reach a lot of people. Mm. Um, they're not necessarily the leaders that are we think of imp as important in real life, the stand up and follow me. It's, it's almost two different meanings of important. Sure. And I mean, they have the power to influence your ideas as well. If somebody right, is... Right, because they can put ideas in front of you. Yeah. If, if I'm very similar to a lot of people, I'm very relatable to a lot of people and something that matters to me, even if I don't have to push very hard, it's like, it's like marketing, but right. more Well, and, and we can organic. get into the social science, but... Yeah. Um, one of the, the between people and the loose connections and being the person that connects one group to another group, those are um, in real life very valuable people to know. Mm -hmm. and, and we, but I want to come back to yeah, that because sure. that's, that's maybe getting a hair off topic. Yeah, sorry, you were. <laughs> right, so uh, here they're just using the likes to try and see if we can predict a few things. 
uh, age, gender, religious views, different sorts of things like that. And these are the results. And so some of them, so uses drugs was a harder one to predict, and that had an AAC score of 65. The number here, higher means more. Higher accurate. means more. Higher, yeah. higher means that is incredibly easy to predict. Got it. So uh, predicting race, that was 95% accurate. Mm -hmm. And that's just from likes. That, But if you think about it, you think about music and all the things that kind of separate a lot of people, sure. that, that it's maybe not surprising. This is culture, yep. Right. Um, gender, 93 very easy to uh, separate there. Mm -hmm. um, sexuality, it's not quite as high as race and gender, but it is at that point eight, and mm -hmm. it is, it, it's very easy to predict just from likes, mm -hmm. um, as is political affiliation. Drug usage is a little harder, um, and predicting whether or not pe parents were together, that's, again, a little harder. Sure. So, I mean, people will probably at least attempt to conceal some of these things. Is right. it, for instance, I mean, if a can can the algorithm like you know tell my sexuality just because I like sexuality related pages or? Well, um, that's a great question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the, these are the ones that that they published, uh, and so you know, for the predictors of of male homosexuality liking a California House Bill 8, oh, which was okay. related to that, yep. that was very predictive. Um, but the other two are not. I mean, cosmetics, okay, yeah, it's very easy to see that most straight guys would not like a cosmetics page. Um, but Wicked the Musical, that's, that's just wicked. Sure. Um, and why is being confused after waking up from naps predictive of heterosexuality? Right. There's, and so this is, a lot of these things are not necessarily things we would think of as indicative of, you know, like, okay, um, oh, I'm trying to, <laughs> Mavis Staples is coming and she's going to go uh, and sing here on Friday night. Sure. And she's awesome. Uh, what am I telling people about me when I say I like Mavis Staples? Right. Um, it's, it's a lot more than just saying you like that one performer. It can say you like a genre. It can say that you uh, subscribe to a political worldview if they're related. Um, it can say that she, you have She does some... have some of those songs. Sure, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I apologize for not catching this reference, so I am just speaking <laughs> it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it can tell you something about socioeconomic status. Like, there's lots of things you can tell about a person by just the fact that they like one performer. Right. Um, and that's one of the really, really amazing things uh, about these these predictive models is that just you know a human might not have guessed that being confused after waking up from naps was something that was indicative of sexuality. But it turned out that that was the case just after it, having this amazingly rich field of data. Right. It was it was useful. Yeah. Um, it, one of many things is the the top three going through the principal components analysis. They would have had a very long list. They just gave us yeah. the top three. Got it. Uh, so you know if you kind of think about this. And you think about, okay, it's that easy to predict whether or not somebody smokes. It's that easy to predict what gender somebody is. Mm -hmm. How hard is it to predict parent? I tend to think that would be pretty easy. Mm -hmm. um, how hard is it to predict gun owner? Uh, sure. The, these, these are things that maybe we don't make an effort to conceal, but at the same time, we don't. We aren't always aware that we're giving this information away. Sure. Or I guess to get a little bit more Black Mirror, how hard would it be to predict likely to commit a certain kind of crime within the next year? Um, well, there's there's actually a lot of algorithms out that people are working on that. I mean, people are trying to predict uh, for criminal sentencing recidivism. Uh, so if if we have somebody in front of a, a judge and the judge is trying to decide what kind of sentence they should get, whether or not we think they're likely to recommit a crime is very pertinent to what kind of sentence mm -hmm. the judge wants to give. But those algorithms are covered, colored by so many different things. Sure. And uh, that's, that's maybe another talk yeah, entirely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, 
the next point here, anonymization is easy to break. Not, not just like it can be done. No, no, it's easy. So when, when you think data is anonymous, there's almost no such thing. Uh, and the census has actually known this for a very long time. And they've got a data mapper that will allow you to find some things out about your region. And in earlier versions of this, um, maybe 10 years ago, that allowed you to get down and map demographic information on a neighborhood level. And you could look at, you could go into the Pittsburgh maps and you could see what are the rich neighborhoods, where are the poor neighborhoods, and, and get into a really fine-grained level of detail. Mm -hmm. They don't let you do that anymore mm -hmm. uh, because as they, they, they were worried about privacy, um, Stephen Feinberg was one of the guys who was really helping them pay attention to this, that they figured 53% of the U U.S. population, if you just have a place, like I live in Pittsburgh, I am female, and if you have my birth date, that's enough to identify me uniquely uh, for 53% sure. of the population. Um, but place, you know, Pittsburgh has quite a few zip codes in it. So if you have, instead of just Pittsburgh, you have an actual zip code, you can identify 87% of the U.S. population. Okay. So this is without knowing, for instance, your name. Like, this is only with zip code, gender, and date of birth. Right. You can uniquely point at a single person. At a single person for 87% okay. of the population. And so that's yeah. the, the fact that our, it's not just our fingerprints that are so unique. It's... There's that much that makes us us. Right. And teaser for the end of the talk, there's a direct analogy with your online habits that actually don't have anything to do with a priori, your zip code, your gender, or date of birth. Um, you can do a very similar kind of thing with just what websites you visit. Uh, and, and so, you know, th they, since 2000, have, have known that you're, uh, you can break anonymization, okay. that, that things that are supposed to be anonymous are not. Um, and Netflix found this out when they did the Netflix prize. They, they had to discontinue this because these guys <laughs> looked at, they, Netflix was releasing anonymous data and having people put out, try, try and come up with the best algorithm to predict what other movies people were going to like. They wanted to upgrade their recommendation engine. Mm -hmm. And these guys took the anonymous Netflix data and the IMDb data, and they, they matched it up, and they were able to match a huge number of records uh, just from movie habits. So if you rated two movies on IMDb, uh, and those dates are reasonably lined up with the Netflix dates, mm -hmm. they got 68% of the records matched up that way. Okay. They got 99% of the records that they had rated eight movies. So eight data points. It's really only six because two of the eight might be completely wrong. Okay. Um, and dates accurate to within two weeks. So, I mean, that's by and large. I watched the movie on Netflix and then like half a month later, I'm on IMDb. Oh, yeah, I liked that. So, and that 99% of people. So the behavior of the movies, those timestamps of the movie, again, it's almost like a fingerprint. Okay. So the data that was involved with this was IMDb ratings they and had, then Netflix watching history? They had Netflix ratings and dates on. So they had, oh, it was also reviews yeah, for well, Netflix? Not, not any text. Okay. Just, uh, this was when Netflix was still using stars. So oh, okay. it was one star, five stars. Got it. And uh, so Netflix scrubbed the the people information from it and right. just kept like this the, person liked this movie, this movie, and this movie. Got it. And for each movie they watched, they had the rating and uh, so you can think of if if you were thinking of the data set and, mm -hmm. the, and what you would have, you would have person, uh, movie, rating, and date. Okay, got it. And so this group was able to take an a different data set that was published <laughs> by a different group. Right. Also, I guess like anonymized in certain ways. Well, IMDb, the ratings on it are public okay. so that you know people can build profiles and the ratings of personas. You didn't have to use your real name on IMDb. Okay. Uh, but But right, so they were able to take these two like different data sets but then figure out who in this data set corresponded to who in that data set. Right. And they they actually um, I mean they had different ways to check this, but um, they actually talked to some of their friends who were oh, they knew okay. were in the IMDb <laughs> database and were like, hey, is this you? And 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's awesome. scary. Yeah. So that's the the anonymization is, and we've known for a, a while now that anonymization is this easy to break. Sure. Um, and, and this one is just to kind of drive the point home. So in 1997, the group Insurance Commission, they released anonymized health records uh, from Massachusetts. They, they had uh, visit, diagnosis, procedure, all of this very personal information, and they, they had removed the names and the labels. But they um, did keep the zip, birth date, and sex? Right. Okay. Well, I mean, if you're looking at medical data, the age and gender of the patient are very important right, for right. the medical history. Yep. Um, but that zip codes, that's that third identifying piece of information. And so they took the voter list, which has actually who you are, uh, your, your name, your address, <laughs> but it's also got your birth date and your gender and your sure. zip code. And they matched them up. It'd be so easy. The, yeah. And um, they actually identified Governor Weld, who was the governor of Massachusetts at that point in time, because only six people <laughs> shared his birth date. Only three were men, and he was the only one of those six people in his zip code. And so uh, now they had the governor's medical history. So th this is, you know, if you go back, 87% of Americans could be identified this way with anonymized data, with just that little information. Yeah. Um, and so the final point here, there are real consequences when this sort of stuff happens. Because, I mean, we might think, you know, marketing, okay, I like martial arts, so Facebook can't figure out whether I am female or male, and they keep showing me ads for the wrong underwear. Oh, well. <laughs> um, but at the same time, maybe I've got a medical condition, and the advertiser has figured out that I have this medical condition, and now I'm seeing ads for chemo or uh, dialysis mm -hmm. and seeing these ads at work and now everybody at work knows I have this medical condition mm -hmm. and um, that for some places that people work that is not a safe thing mm -hmm. um, and you've also got the other issues so somebody gets categorized as diabetes interest which that's a category data brokers use okay so they see ads for sugar-free products maybe that's benign, mm -hmm. but now they're suddenly in a high risk insurance category, depending on who has that data and how they use it. Mm -hmm. um, so relevant question here just from, okay. from Joseph asking, there's enormous value in this data to improve our lives and create economic value. How can we get transparency and control? That is exactly the issue. That's, that is it. And there, there is, and I, you know, these examples are, uh, I'm trying to emphasize the risks right now, but there are, are tremendous benefits. And um, you know, I like the fact that Google can tell me, oh, there's an accident on the bridge that you usually take home, go another way. I love that. Right. But that means that Google knows how I go home. Um, and so that, that is the real question. And a lot of what we're doing, this is, that's one of the reasons we set this up as a, a two-part webinar, mm -hmm. was here we're talking about what's possible and what can be done. So we have the language to address these problems. And that question is really what we're going to focus on in the next one. What, what, should, re what, what should regulation look like? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, please, please t tune in for that one as well. Our goal in this presentation is not to tell you that the world is bad or that data is bad. It's to show you that data is extremely useful. It's and powerful. It, and yeah, powerful. And so yeah, in the next in the next presentation, there's going to be extensive talk about what, what can be done and like what are regulatory right. best practices, what should people be well, talking and the, about. And there was um, an editorial out recently and I thought it really kind of hit the nail on the head because they were talking about how a lot of sciences uh, have had a reckoning with dynamite. Dynamite is powerful, but it's also it can be destructive. Mm -hmm. And chemistry has had this reckoning, and medicine has had this reckoning. And is this the reckoning for computer science? Mm -hmm. That data is extremely powerful, but it let's not see things destroyed. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's let's control it before we get there. Can we work one more from Frank here asking how to prevent a document from losing its metadata after being shared in encrypted media like WhatsApp? Is that? So if you... I'll read again. How to prevent a document from losing its metadata 
after being shared in encrypted media like WhatsApp? Um, okay, so there's two ways that he might mean losing there, because losing could mean like the metadata is gone, or losing could be the metadata is now out Given and available. Somebody, yeah. And um, that's kind of the thing about metadata is you can't keep it hidden because it's the outside of the envelope. Like you know, I if if I send you an email, that record is there, and maybe people see what's in the email, maybe people don't. Right. But the the fact that that email was sent is some, that, that doesn't go away. Somebody owns these servers. Um, I think one, one way that we didn't show in the video clip, but that was in the same larger talk was, uh, again, Zuckerberg was saying, like, we're Facebook. We give you the opportunity to share all this data. E yeah, like, we own some it's of what this we data. Do. It's what we do. Listen. Um, so at, the end, at some point, there's always going to be a, somebody's going to know where this data was going. I guess I have not heard of... Um, a communications like company that allows you to say we don't know a single thing about how you're using our service. That would be actually a really cool like business model. Right. Um, Signal does a lot of encryption, but I don't know. I I am not that up on exactly how Signal works to know at what level the encryption works. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if there's, if we maybe did not address the root question that you were trying to ask, please uh, just ask it again to Shane in, in like a more detailed way and we'll, we'll try to get to that. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, kind of going to the real consequences, some of the incidental sharing of this data can lead to uh, harassment, stalking. Uh, there's a reason that school principals never put their phone number in the phone book because teenagers sometimes make bad choices. Mm -hmm. And and so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a thing. Um, and, and so having people who have known for a long time my phone number should not be in the phone book, now suddenly everything is out there and exposed, that's... Th there are risks there. Um, one of the other risks, when Google um, created Google Plus and they just kind of lumped everybody into your friends and they made it very flat, like, like Facebook is very flat, mm -hmm. like everybody that is your friend is your friend. There's no hierarchies of friends. A lot of the people who had been emailing, they, they email their friends, but they also have emails that they send to their ex-husband and at one point, he was not their ex-husband, and he had friends, and they might have been CC'd. And when Google Plus opened that up and made it flat, uh, suddenly they were re-exposed to that abusive relationship. And that there, there were a lot of stories. Google fixed that pretty quickly, mm -hmm. but they didn't anticipate it. We have uh, another question in the chat here from B.J. Johnson. Thank you for the question. It says, Scott McNeely said in 1999, there is no such thing as privacy any longer. Get over it. We've known about the situation for a long time. So since you are showing us how gaining understanding of our data in this manner is so easy, it seems that by using social engineering, the bad guys can figure out our auth authentication credentials easily. How can anyone feel their data is safe at all, ever? So I want to start, I think that there's a lot in this, so thank you for that question. I want to start by saying mm -hmm. the techniques we've, we've talked about today are actually, I don't think that knowing your username and password is, a, um, is the main thing that people are getting out of these techniques. Um, if, you are, if you have bad username and password practices, then yes, you're at risk. But you can do simple things like uh, don't use the same password for every single thing. Uh, use a complicated password that's, or use a, a actually a password uh, right. manager. Well, this a lot of what we're talking about here isn't even like authentication, yeah. how we log into the systems. This is this is the stuff that we think we're okay with sharing, right? But it leads to inferences that we might not be okay with sharing. Yeah, this is not authentication. It's not how can a person pretend that they're me. It's what can a person know about me, and how does that influence their actions that affect me. Um, so there are there are definitely like user user rights um, best practices that are are not really related to this discussion. Um, your data is is safe like slash we work at a cybersecurity group like 
there's always a way for somebody to gain access to the thing because there's always somebody smarter than whoever engineered your your security. Um, usually, you know, if you're not a super high, high profile target, I don't know. I I feel uncomfortable saying like you can probably rest easy because nobody's like, well, gonna <laughs> you know. So I, after the Experian and Equifax and all the data breaches, my credit is locked down. Mm -hmm. Like, so if I, I assume that after Target and Home Depot and Experian, somebody has my data. Mm -hmm. And so I have my credit locked down where nobody can open an account in my name. Uh, it's just, I, I assume that at some point my data's been stolen. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that's the hackers coming into a system and getting things that they're not supposed to have. That's almost a separate problem. It's a very real problem. Mm -hmm. It's one that we deal with in this building every day. Mm -hmm. But you know what we're talking about are the things that I'm not afraid to share. Right. Right. But like the, the it's 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 public, right? Yeah. yeah. Or it's 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 just between you and me. Um, yeah. And. What, what we can learn from the things that we think we're OK with sharing. Yeah. Thank you for the question, BJ. OK. Um, I think we're done with that. So actually, this, this example is kind of bridges that gap between the criminal activity and the, well, we thought we were OK with sharing this. Because this has happened, there were several big cases last year that were prosecuted. Um, but people had taken identifying information, so names, addresses, social security numbers, things that they could get that were real people um, and real information, like the real bank, bank account numbers. Mm -hmm. And then they attached them to fake debts. They made up, so I have your information, I know that you exist. I have your existence information. I'm now going to put you in a database and say, you owe somebody $10,000. And then I'm gonna take that, that database of debts that I have made up and sell that. Um, because once the, that goes to the debt collectors, that those debts have been sold and the debt collectors can just collect on them. Mm -hmm. And so these things, this happened multiple times last year, that the identity information was attached to fake information. And so the debt collectors went out and were harassing people and collecting these mm -hmm. debts. And some people paid debts that they did not owe, mm -hmm. never mind the harassment cost of like, go away. Uh, and so this, this is one of those that's, it's on that, that border of, this is clearly criminal, but they have access to it through things that were not criminal. Right. Yeah, Your so turn. for the rest, <laughs> we have about 13 minutes left, and I want to talk about some good practices, some personal, personal precautions. Um, I'm even hesitant to say best practices because, again, I mean, there is always someone wilier than you. Uh, but these are some things that you that are kind of a baseline. Here's how you can make yourself um, aware of what you give away, even when you're not actually interacting with like a social network. Um, these are just things that you leave around when you're using the internet. So, for one, I want to talk about cookies. Uh, so a cookie is not code. A cookie is a small text file. It's just data just data, that's stored on your machine by websites that you visit in order to remember information that's specific to you. So these were designed in order to make the internet more convenient to use. The, the use case uh, that they were designed under was if you're using a shopping uh, like website and you want to close that window, do some other stuff in your day, and come back and open the window and have your shopping cart remain, that's what a cookie is for because they want to be able to save on your machine the, the some of the history of what you've been doing on that website. It's designed to make your life less annoying. Um, and, and, it, and, and another thing that it can be used for is re, um, authentication, so that you don't have to type your password every time that you go to another page on the same website. The, the, the website wants to remember that you've already proven you are who you are. So in this analogy, um, a cookie is like a card, and you're using a service, let's say Twitter, and the Twitter uh, Twitter says, Hi, thanks for logging in. Take this card, show it to me next time you visit. So why might they want to do that? Well, so there are actually two, two distinguishments, distinguishments to be made about 
cookies, and that's in their origin and in who's asking for them. So a first party cookie is when a cookie is set or requested about the domain that you're visiting. So you're visiting Twitter, and Twitter says, hi, can I see your Twitter cookie? I want to make sure that you're logged in. That way I don't have to bother you with, with typing your password again. This is in order to make your life easier. There's also a third party cookie, which is a cookie set or requested about a domain other than the one that you're visiting. So if you're reading the news, let's say you're on CNN, and CNN wants to populate a box that allows you to post about this, this, uh, this article to Twitter. CNN might say, can you show me your Twitter cookie? If you're logged in, I'll add a tweet box for you. And if not, then I will not. It's a way to, to make these websites more interactive. So a third party cookie is the, uh, the website that you're on asks about information from a website that you're not on right now. So that can be used for, a fair, I think that's a, a pretty benign use case, but the, the same kind of concept can be used for advertisements or for tracking in general. So Google AdSense is a uh, very widely used ad platform. And so uh, AdSense says, hi, I see that you're on a website about public, pu Pittsburgh public transit. I would like to record that information. And can you please hold that information about yourself on your machine? Um, and then next time you visit a different website, let's say it's about uh, dogs. I want to record that you're interested in both P Pittsburgh public transit and dogs, and maybe one about babies. And so um, you're probably never going to the AdSense website um, when you are you're, you're surfing the internet. But if you do not disable these third-party cookies, um, just a totally a, a separate third party can acquire this information about you and build a profile. It is specifically to to see what you're interested in and give you ads that it'll think you care about more. Um, that's becoming closer to malice. And of course, if that's possible for advertisers to do, it's also possible for people who like actually want to hurt you um, to do. And so there, the great thing is uh, you can do something about it. So for one is incognito or private browsing. Um, you're probably already aware of this. But one of the things that this is really useful for is that it doesn't save anything on your machine from your website uh, browsing. So it will not save your browsing history, and it will not save your cookies and site data. Uh, so this does not mean that everything you're doing is, is obscured from the world entirely. In fact, I mean, as it says on the incognito site, um, or like the, the splash screen, your employer can see what websites you're still visiting. Like your internet service provider can still see what websites you go to. This is saying, I don't want to save that data on my own machine. Mm -hmm. And so this is really useful for lots of reasons. Um, one of them would be blocking blocking cookies to, um, you don't want to have information, you don't want to facilitate the gathering of information about you. Another thing you can do is actually just disable third party cookies. And so first party cookies, the ones that are uh, requested or set by the domain that you're trying to visit are generally okay. They're usually there to make your life easier and don't need to be turned off. Um, but third party cookies can actually be disabled in each browser that you use. And uh, so you can just kind of search for, you know, I use, let's say, Safari or Chrome, and different browsers are going to differ in the settings that they allow. But all of them um, enable some form of disabling third party cookies. Uh, some of them will disable, for instance, setting, but not disable reading, which can still be problematic, but less so than just freely doing <laughs> cookie things. Uh, <laughs> Cookie things. <laughs> another, another totally different thing is, so what if I actually just totally uh, did not um, allow cookies to be transmitted or received at all? Um, can somebody still tell about me? And the answer is yes. So uh, browser fingerprinting, there's a source on this which is uh, listed on the next slide. But you can go to miunique.org for more information. But um, a website in this modern era it will ask your browser for information about itself and about your computer so that it can display content most effectively and most beautiful to you. So some things it's going to want to know. What browser and operating system are you using in order to know that I'm compatible at all? Uh, what plugins are installed? So how should I modify the screen based on that? Uh, what fonts are available? What screen resolution is there? So that's just like that's just stuff about your computer. It's there's nothing like that you would think is about you about any of that right. information. However, that information taken together can be used to uniquely identify you. So it's the equivalent of the birth date and zip code and Yeah, place. it is, it is it's exactly almost like exactly. that. Um, so the point of this is they don't have to ask, yeah, they don't have to ask, like, what's your name? I mean, this is, this is not like somebody at the store knowing what your name is. 
This is like somebody at the store knowing, oh, I've seen you before. You're the one with the brown hair and the thick eyebrows, and you bought uh, diapers last week. Like, I recognize you, and I can also talk to my friend who works at a different store and say, yeah, like they came in and bought diapers again. Um, so <laughs> this cannot be disabled. Uh, there, you, can, you can check out amiunique.org in order to figure out whether you are unique. In this case, this is a screenshot from my machine. And um, you can see only 0.12% of observed browsers were using the browser version that I did. So that's already a super small <laughs> number of people just without me like, knowing anything. Right. Um, and it turns out that there's actually one of the data attributes that's hidden here is makes me completely unique. Like they're they're able to tell, mm -hmm. assign a unique ID number to me and say and watch me across the the web. Um, so just like be aware that this can happen to you and that people can recognize you even if they don't know your right. name. I, I would go so far as not it can it has. It, yeah, they do. Um, and so to give you an example of this in usage, in 2012, the Wall Street Journal um, talked to or in some way like interacted with Orbitz, and Orbitz found that people who use Apple Mac computers uh, are likely to spend more on hotels. And so there was some kerfuffle about the reporting, but eventually it came out. They don't, uh, they don't give you a higher price for each hotel room, but they do, in their search results, sort higher priced hotels more to the, closer to the top if they detect that you're using a Mac computer. And that's interesting. Is this malicious or not? Um, it, like, it, I mean, it feels this, kind of malicious. Well, so I don't know, right? So in an analogy, the point of Google is, is, as Google searching, is to give you the most relevant stuff close to the top. Right. Um, there's going to be a million search results for every Google search that you do, but you want to see the, the stuff that you care about on the first page. Right. I, I want uh, Google knows for me that when I type EDM, I mean educational data mining, not electronic dance yeah, music. Yeah, sure. And, and that's not annoying to you in order right. to get the, the right result. So uh, listen, like they're keeping a profile on you. This is how the internet works right now. Um, it is not on its own malicious, but it is just how it works. Um, so there's other attributes that they used in order to influence the ranking, and these are just things that you that are are not about like they're just about how you use the internet. Right. And I just want to spend a couple more minutes talking about some best like some uh, again more good practices. So this is specific to Facebook, um, but this kind of thing can be can be done with your I'm other. I'm gonna make sure we have time to get another question. Oh sure, okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we, we, we're good. We, we'll we'll get, okay. yeah, get through your slide and then we can clear cool. off. So awesome. you can revoke access to, to apps that ask for um, access to your online credentials. Um, what that means is that you say you're no longer allowed to gather information on me. It does not mean you must delete all the information you have on me. And in fact, like that, that is just not available. That option is not there. Um, not in America. Yeah. And finally, if you do use Facebook, I highly recommend checking out these two tabs that are, that are highlighted here, the apps and websites and ads. Uh, I did this yesterday and was like shocked, although I shouldn't have been, at how much they knew about me and how they were tailoring their content to me. Uh, just, I, I'm not going to say stop using Facebook, but I will say it would be really a good idea to know how much they know about you. Right. Well, and, and you're going to be surprised because one of the things, I bought something from another online retailer, and they had given my email address to Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so Facebook knew that I had made a purchase from them, even though I never told Facebook I made that purchase. Right. And, and that's, again, some of the data that, came, that was available through that Cambridge Analytica API. Yeah. But did, did I agree to tell everybody I did business with this retailer? Sure. Uh, so yeah, that is all the, I guess now we've got a wrap-up slide here, and then we can take some questions. So, Yeah, so the, the three big takeaways, I mean, if you remember nothing else that we've talked about, metadata is data. There's no such thing as anonymous, and there are real consequences. Great, so we, we do have a, some, some backlog of questions here. So 
we got about a minute, so we may go a minute over, so we understand that people have to leave it too, but we'll, we'll get through as many questions as we can here. Um, you guys mentioned earlier, this was not to cause fear, it was just to show you where, where data is, how it's being used. So there was a question that came in, do you have specific examples or case studies of these types of data being used for good things? Sure. I mean, neutral would be Google ranking, ranking relevant things closer right. to you. Good things, I... Um, I, I have a pretty good one that um, there's, there's a couple of, um, kind of like there's Doctors Without Borders, there's a couple of statisticians and data miners uh, groups along those lines. Mm -hmm. And one of the, there was a hackathon a little while ago, it was a couple of years ago, but it, it stuck out because they had done, they took all the records of who owned which properties and what complaints had been filed and things that are normally kind of all over everywhere. And they pulled it together and they did some of the same social network analysis and they were able to identify the central landlords in this network graph and encourage the DAs, uh, it provided evidence so that those delinquent landlords could be prosecuted and um, also let them know which targets they needed to go after first. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it enabled the prosecution of uh, some, some criminal activity in that case. Um, a related, or actually a different example would be um, healthcare analytics is actively trying to help uh, healthcare teams figure out whether you're at risk for certain things. So right. this can be used to, uh, to leak your diabetes information, but it can also be used for your doctor to say, oh, you're like these other 100 people who had this particular, th this particular illness. We know how to treat you, and we know how to contact you and say you're at risk. Right, and I, I, I think that that's a, a great example because it shows the, it's a two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. the, the, there's power for good, and there's power for not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a question from Michael. With both your, your backgrounds in machine learning, what one book or resource would you recommend to a serious student of machine learning? Um, if, if you want to get into the math of it, I highly recommend uh, Hasty and Tibshrani's Elements of Statistical Learning. It, it is by far, uh, it, it's got everything in there. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, to, if you want to get into the computer-like <laughs> oriented side of it, I would highly recommend actually checking out the, uh, the scikit-learn sort of just like tutorial. Um, scikit-learn is a Python package that is uh, just sort of dripping with low-hanging fruit as far as how to do very basic machine learning. Okay. Right, between the two of those, you should be set for a while. Great, great presentation today, thank you very much. As Ellie and um, Carson, or Ellie, uh, April and Carson um, mentioned throughout the webcast, we are gonna have a part two on June 20th. It's gonna be digital footprints, privacy and security will be the second part. So we'll be able to touch on some of those, uh, many questions that came in about that, those aspects. Um, upon exiting today's event, we ask you to fill out our survey. The survey tab is available in the chat window now. So thanks again for everybody for attending today. Thanks again for a wonderful presentation. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.